this is a, a block party on my block in Seattle. And, you know, thinking about, okay, we have a lot of space in our communities dedicated to cars. Um, how can we use that space to differently? And for me, as someone who can't drive, it was interesting because during the pandemic, as more of my neighbors were around, as everyone stopped driving as much, we had a really wonderful time connecting uh, through block parties to our neighbors in a way that there wasn't that sort of connection before. And I think, you know, it was especially transformational for me because I'm not able to easily get across town to visit someone. We don't really have the, the reliable transit here in Seattle the way, um, you know, it, it's, it can be, you know, a 10 minute drive and it'll take an hour on the, on the bus, right? That's just the reality. And so having those social connections close by is so important. Uh, it would also be great to have, you know, more uh, more 15 minute city type opportunities like a pharmacy and, you know, a rec center and you know, those types of things as well. But we can start by building those communities with our neighbors. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Anna Zivarts, author of the new book, When Driving Is Not An Option, Steering Away From Car Dependency, published by Island Press. Uh, this is a fascinating book and a fabulous conversation. So let's get right to it with Anna. Anna, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's a joy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you bet. Uh, Anna, we are going to be talking about your brand new book. But before we do that, uh, why don't you just take this uh, opportunity to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Anna. I am based in Seattle, Washington. I actually grew up here in Washington State. And I was born with a neurological condition called nystagmus. Makes my eyes wiggle all the time. So you can, if you're really perceptive, you might be able to pick that up in the video. And what that means is that my visual acuity uh, isn't great. I see uh, oh, 20, 80 or so on the vision chart, um, best case scenario. Uh, and so I have a really hard time seeing details in the distance or fast moving objects, which means that it is not safe for me to drive a vehicle, drive a car. Uh, and so I am a non-driver and that's been something that I've known my whole life. I, I tried to fight it a bit as a teenager and I <laughs> write about it in the book, uh, having a, a friend try to teach me how to drive and I drove her mom's truck up a tree. Uh, and uh, that was the end of me feeling that maybe driving was going to be an option for me. So I, I was cracking up when I, re I read that part of the, the book. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's yeah, a teenager. It's like, yeah, I, I got this <laughs> until, <laughs> yeah. until you don't. <laughs> you really, I mean, I'm just I'm very, very grateful that 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 was all that happened in that situation. Yeah. The tree was fine. The car was not. But, you know, we were OK and, and nobody got killed. And, I actually did a book event with that friend last weekend, and it's it's cool that she's still around and she's now actually working in similar public health and transportation work. So who would have oh, known? Wow, that's that's yeah. fascinating. That's fascinating. Well, it's an interesting experience to have, and we'll pull up the the, the book cover here uh, of the book. When driving is not an option, steering away from car dependency. Uh, it, it is interesting that young that experience that you had as a as a teenager of you know that sort of mishap that took place. And then, you know, lo and behold, you, you know, end up really working in this area, get passionate about writing about this experience. You wouldn't have known back then that this would be what you were passionate about. Talk a little bit about the origin stories of when you really could have shifted gears, if you pardon the pun, <laughs> bad pun, <laughs> uh, to do work in this arena. Yeah, so growing up, you know, I grew up in Washington State in a pretty rural area, and I didn't know any adults who didn't drive. And so I really, I, I just had no conception for how I was going to live um, and, and what my life was going to be like as someone who was going to have to get rides everywhere. And so I left Washington State, and I moved to the place where I'd heard that the subway ran 24 hours a day, and that was New York. And, and that was really why I moved there. I didn't you know, know people, but I, I knew it was a place where I could get around and have that same sort of freedom of movement that I'd seen my peers have when they got their driver's licenses. And so I lived in New York for close to 15 years, and that was a wonderful experience in, in many ways. It also allowed me to really not be, uh, not disclose to people that I was disabled, which probably, you know, wasn't always great because there's other other things I can't see as well. But um, but it was great to, to have that same sort of mobility freedom and to not worry 
when I saw a job posting, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this job because it's going to, you know, require a driver's license or require me to be able to get around with a car. That just, I, I didn't even have to think about that in New York City. And then, yeah, then my son was born and he had this, he has the same eye condition I do. And that was a, a real sort of reckoning moment for me because I understood that I couldn't keep hiding my disability and I needed to start sort of owning that piece of myself and not feeling so ashamed about it because I didn't want him to feel that shame. And that's when I reconnected uh, with the disability community, really actually through Twitter and, and following Alice Wong, who's just tremendous, tremendous advocate there, started to see that there was a place for me in that space. And uh, when the job opportunity opened up and Disability Rights Washington, back in Washington state, I moved um, to, be, to take that job and also to, to be closer to family. And through that work started to realize that there were so many other people who couldn't drive and I hadn't known those people growing up uh, and I wish I had, but I didn't. And I, I, I really thought I was alone. And I started meeting all these other non-drivers and recognizing that there was a lot of us out there and that uh, there was a, a lack of awareness, both about how many non-drivers there were and then what our mobility needs were and uh, how in, in meeting those needs, we could create communities that were more accessible for everyone. Yeah. So you, you mentioned there uh, about where you grew up and what that was like and the fact that you know pretty much everybody had to drive and did drive. And this is partly the reason why this is what it yep. looked like. <laughs> yep. And, you know, this is a lot of our country, right? This is a lot of the U.S. is, is roads like this. And so, you know, I think people, when they think about non-drivers, they think about people who live in urban areas, who live in apartment buildings, who are, live close to transit, who have great sidewalks and uh, great connectivity. And the reality is that non-drivers live everywhere, even and especially in our rural areas, because our cities have become so expensive and housing is so expensive. So, you know, there's a lot of people who this is what they look at when they need to go somewhere. And it's it's not easy, especially if it's dark and it's raining and, you know, there's no bus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not to say that this environment that we're looking at here on screen and for those of, uh, of you who are in the listening only audience, we're looking at, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a narrowish rural road with no shoulder, per se, no paved shoulder, you know, cutting through the, you know, the pine trees, you know, sort of, a you know, what you'd expect to see uh, in, in the Pacific Northwest. And and yeah, there's there's literally no provision for anybody um, who needs to walk or bike um, or use a wheelchair, uh, you know, outside of the actual motor vehicle traveling. You mentioned, yeah, you're not alone. And, and this image, I think, really sort of exemplifies that there's it's a vast um, there's a variety of different people uh, involved with that. So walk us through that. And then as you do that, I, I might add uh, one that I may not see in this this image, but go ahead. Who are the non-drivers that are out there? Yeah, who are the non-drivers? So, and I talk about this in my book, sort of one of the initial chapters really goes through all the different kinds of, of reasons people can't drive or can't afford to drive or choose not to drive. Uh, you know, for, for the book, I really focus on what I call the involuntary non-drivers, people who don't have a choice about it, uh, either because of a physical disability, a mental health condition, chronic health condition, um, because they can't afford to, perhaps because of immigration status. Um, so there's there's lots of reasons people, people can't drive. Age, right? People too young to drive, people who are aging out of driving. This image here shows a group of disabled non-drivers, and the book really does center around disability because that's an experience I think a lot of people don't understand or there's so much shame about talking about that, uh, that, it's, that it, needs, it needs more light. And so that's uh, the, the group of folks that I work with here. This is a group called Empower Movement Washington, which is a group of black and brown disabled non-drivers from throughout the state of Washington who came together for a walk roll audit. And um, in this picture is Mike McGinn, uh, the director of America Walks. And, and so, you know, th those experiences, I think, are, are really important for people to understand because, um, you know, my experience as someone who's white, who presents a lot of the time as non-disabled, unless you know me pretty well or know about um, people with low vision or nystagmus, um, I'm someone who can bike for transportation. You know, those things are different and, and provide different access uh, levels than perhaps someone who's in a wheelchair 
or who doesn't have uh, the ability to bike, um, someone of a different race, um, you know, those, those are all things that are different. And so I talk about, you know, the different kinds of disabilities that can prevent driving and, uh, and also that the intersection between disability and poverty and disability and race that can make getting around unsafe um, or, or impossible. Yeah, yeah. I had to smile when I saw Mike the, in, in the shot here. That's great. By, Mike McGinn, of course, is a, a good friend of mine. He's the former mayor of, uh, of Seattle and uh, the current executive director of America Walks and a past guest here on the Active Towns podcast. And so it's always good to see Mike. And uh, Mike is going to, or America Walks is going to come up later in our conversation because there's a, a really exciting uh, program uh, that you highlight in the book and I've highlighted here on the podcast in the past. But uh, let's let's continue with this journey. Sounds good. So this next image is an image of, of uh, Tanisha, who's someone I work with and who I also interviewed for the book. Um, and she's a wheelchair user. She uses a power wheelchair and she is rolling down the side of the street in Seattle where she lives because the sidewalk between her house and the nearest bus stop is so cracked and uprooted and covered in loose gravel that it's completely inaccessible and unsafe for her to use in her wheelchair. And so you know, after I sort of talk about in the book the different types of reasons people can't drive or can't afford to drive or don't drive, I really get into what are some of the barriers that we experience as non-drivers. And a big one, probably the, the biggest one, and, and perhaps it doesn't receive enough attention, is that lack of pedestrian connectivity, whether that's because of, you know, lack of access or lack of infrastructure or in environments just being completely miserable to be a pedestrian in because you're next to a highway. Um, that noise, uh, the air pollution, um, you know, some of the, the the harassment you can get as a pedestrian. So this is a, an image of, of, of Tanisha. And, you know, it's not safe for her to be where she is on the side of the road here. Uh, she, you know, can get doored, she can get hit, she gets a lot of harassment, but it's, it's the only option she has. And it um, that, that pedestrian connectivity is, is so overlooked. And I think I have a couple more images too that, uh, you know, crossings, right, is another big one. Um, whether that's crossing, you know, the arterial to get to the bus stop, we build all this, you know, high speed bus rapid transit along arterials, and then we expect people to be able to cross. And how does that work? Um, this is a, a freeway off ramp. And there's, you know, so many places in our cities, we build highways, and then we build these on ramps and off ramps. And pedestrians still have to cross at these places. And it's not a safe or pleasant environment when cars are thinking about, you know, freeway speeds and not encountering pedestrians. And this one is another example here in Seattle where we're building a light rail station in the middle of a freeway interchange. And so pedestrians are going to have to navigate these unsignalized, there's no stoplight, uh, off ramps and on ramps to get to the light rail. Just a, a really miserable and unsafe um, design choice. Yeah. This also reminds me too. Uh, this happens to be a, a, an off ramp, but uh, it it also reminds me of slip lanes. We put in slip lanes all over the place too, you know, unnecessarily to to be able to try to prioritize the quick movement of motor vehicles. But it, it creates the same type of dangerous uh, scenario and situation for people trying to cross said slip lane to be able to hopefully get to some form of refuge to then be able to cross the next lane. So, yeah, I would love I've been fantasizing about making a band slip lanes T-shirt. And there's there's one right on my block, actually, that's so unnecessary um, coming from, you know, one arterial to another. And you're like, this is, you know, it's just in the middle of a city. Why? Why? It's funny. It's it, it's it's funny. You should mention that. I'll, I'll go back to this, you know, about the you know, about this, you know, with this in, in the context of a slip lane. Uh, I actually have a store. I can make a T-shirt like that. I would love it. <laughs> right now, my store has a whole bunch of these. You know, I've got coffee yeah. cups, streets are for people, and T-shirts, too. So, uh, sorry for the little commercial there, Make folks. some band slip lanes. I would, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that. Those. I'll do that. <laughs> All right, here we are. Now, this looks familiar to me because I did live in Chicago for a while in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as well as Boulder, Colorado. So, yeah, this looks familiar. Yes. So, you know, there's also all the sort of other things that block sidewalks that maybe aren't permanent, but are are just as, as you know, large as barriers. You know, we have plants, you can have A-frame signs, you can have ice, you can have snow. This is an image. 
And uh, this is an image of Seattle, believe it or not. This is my neighborhood. Um, and there's someone who cleared their driveway very nicely and left the sidewalk totally a, a mess of ice and snow. And, you know, for, for able-bodied, uh, non-disabled pedestrians, that can, you know, be, it can be slippery. It can be dangerous. If you are a wheelchair user, it means you're stuck in your home because you don't have traction on something like this. And if you're blind, again, it can be, um, and use a white cane, right? It's just not possible to navigate something like this. And so... Uh, we often leave sidewalk clearing to the individual property owner and then it doesn't happen and people get stuck at home for unsafe periods of time. And there's a, I talk in the book with uh, folks from Access Living who have been working on a campaign there to get municipal sidewalk clearing in Chicago, which is really exciting. They just finally got a, a pilot started uh, that's going to hopefully roll out next year. So something to aspire to um, in other places, especially places that get a lot of snow. Yeah, and you, you bring up a really good point about uh, just how dangerous this type of situation can be. And, and it's always been curious to me that in the United States, this is the way that we treat sidewalks because technically sidewalks are considered part of the right of way of the, 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 <laughs> of the actual transportation network and system. And it's the only situation that I can think of where, oh, and by the way, we're going to push the responsibility of making sure that this is a clear and safe right of way over to the responsibility of the property owner adjacent to it. You certainly don't have that level of responsibility in the rest of the right of way. So it's not the responsibility of the owner who did their driveway to also go out and, you know, clear the snow from the the street in front of their house. And, and so it's just really mind boggling to me that we do this. And as somebody who studied gerontology, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, it also is a, a very, very serious potential trip hazard and slip hazard for us as we continue to get up in age. And one of the most dramatic things that, you know, can kind of turn things for for older adults is to have a slip and fall and a broken hip. And uh, and and it kind of, you know, gets to the old cliche is we're all, you know, uh, eventually uh, on a trajectory of disability at some point in time in our life, as well as uh, and we can also say the same thing of, of people, able bodied drivers who are able to drive now, eventually they age out. And so that's another group of non drivers uh, that also exist is uh, it's something that you start off not being able to drive when you're too young to drive and then eventually you age out if you're able to survive that long and not slip on this ice right here yeah no and i think that's such an important reminder that right in and i didn't hit on this number when i was talking about non-drivers but you know all together if you take everyone who can't drive because of a disability everyone who can't afford to drive everyone aging out of driving, everyone too young to drive, we're 30% of the population, right? It, it across the US and that's a huge number. And it's, and, and yet it's not a number that's, that's accepted or recognized or, you know, like if you think of a system, designing a system that doesn't work for 30% of the population, why, why do we keep on digging ourselves deeper into car dependency when that is, it's not working for so many people? And um, yeah, and, and the, the difference between the way we treat sidewalks, which are, yes, part of the public right away, just like the streets, and yet it's up to the property owner to maintain, to, you know, repair cracks and bumps and snow and the roads, which, you know, somehow warrant public resources for, for potholes, right? That it, it, it really, you know, is grating. Yeah. It's very, very, very confusing and frustrating for sure. Uh, talking about the the percentages of non-drivers that are out there, I did have uh, Kathy Tuttle uh, on uh, the podcast a couple of times. And uh, the first time she was on, we actually talked about non-drivers extensively in a study that she did in Portland, where she was able to account for nearly 40% of the, the population there in Portland is what would be considered non-drivers. And she mentioned at the time, and you mentioned this in the book, that that's an underestimate too, because there's yeah. lots of people we just have a hard time accounting for. Talk a little bit about that. We do, right? I mean, there's some folks who are clearly right, like myself, I can't drive and that's that's not gonna change. Um, but for other folks, it's more transitory, right? You know, perhaps it's okay that your car, you have a car, um, but right now it needs a repair and you can't get that repair made until you get your next paycheck. 
or you know perhaps your household has one car but your partner uses it most of the time and you only get it you know when it's not being used by that other person or you know perhaps you have a disability where you have good days and bad days and on good days you can drive some places and on bad days you can't or i talk about erica in the book who uses a power wheelchair but can't afford a wheelchair accessible vehicle. So she can use her vehicle to drive to drive through situations, but she can't get out of her vehicle. And so, you know, for most of the time, she'd much rather take transit because I mean, she can actually go in and do things um, and not just be stuck in the car. So, you know, it, it's not a very strict binary, um, but it also, I think is a really useful frame to talk about, you know, people who every need can't be met by just grabbing their keys and going whenever they want to. Yeah. And, um, yeah. 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 Good stuff. All right. Moving on. So transit, uh, transit access, transit reliability, transit going, you know, where we need it to go, when we need it to go. That's another major need, right? That everyone who can't drive um, relies on, especially for longer distances, right? And, and because so much of our communities here in the U.S. are, are large and the distances we need to travel are large, transit can, can really fill those gaps. And this is a this is an image of Abby Griffith. She's an organizer with uh, Transit Riders Union in Portland, Oregon now. But she worked with me uh, as an intern for a while on the story map work I, I did at Disability Rights Washington. And she grew up in a in a rural area in Washington State, like I did, and didn't have any transit access. And she's blind, and so she had to you know get rides when she could from her mom, but. Her mom was busy, single mom, working hard, full time, other kids. And so she mostly just felt really isolated at home. And um, she talks to me about the joy she felt when she was finally able to get her own apart apartment in Vancouver, Washington, which is near Portland, and what that felt like to be able to live near a bus stop and walk to that bus stop and go when she wanted to go somewhere, where she wanted to go. And that that liberation, I think, similar to how I felt when I moved to New York, right? That it's just, it really does make a huge difference. And so, you know, funding transit and funding fixed route transit uh, is really great, um, is really critical, and there's no substitute. Uh, and yeah, there's no substitute. So I'm going to go back to a, a, an example of a bus stop that would not be very nice for her. And that's this one. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, and this fits right back into that, that pedestrian access piece, right? Like we need to think about transit and, and, and sidewalks going together. This is something that Crystal Montero is another advocate I interview in the book talks about if the sidewalk isn't accessible and doesn't get you to the transit stop or the transit stop doesn't, isn't accessible, then that transit isn't accessible. Um, and this is an example of a transit stop. This is in the tri cities area in Washington state where there's a curb and loose gravel and a transit stop on the far side of that loose gravel. And it was a high speed road, no shoulder uh, right there. Like there's no, there's no shoulder to wait on if you couldn't wait in the loose gravel. And if you're in a wheelchair, this is not a place you can get to. Um, and so and if you're in a wheelchair and you need to use this stop, it probably means you are relying on paratransit instead, which means, you know, scheduling 24 hours in advance, waiting an hour, two hours for the pickup, you know, not being able to leave when you're ready, having to wait for that return trip. It, it's, it's really, I mean, people complain about the inconvenience of fixed route transit, but paratransit is even more difficult um, to, 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 to make work um, in a way that you can live a, a, a complete life um, because it, it just takes so long and the pre-scheduling is so intense. So um, part, of, part of addressing that, right, is having accessible stops where people can, um, you know, wait, wait safely, wait comfortably, have shelter from the rain, shelter from the sun, a uh, smooth place to wait if you're in a wheelchair and um, trash cans. I've always dreamed about, you know, better things. I think there's some reports about how to make, you know, transit stops more kid friendly when you're waiting with a, bo a bored uh, kid, you know, something uh, to keep them busy would be really great. But there's, there's you know, there's so much more we could do um, to make our transit stops and transit centers more pleasant places, bathrooms, you know, all that. What's interesting too on this image that we're looking at here, and again for the listening audience, we're looking at a very, very wide uh, strode. <laughs> it's at least, I think it's five lanes. It's it's two very, very wide travel lanes plus a center turn lane. And in the background, you can see a church 
that is there. And so you can reasonably see that this could be a, uh, a meaningful destination for, you know, perhaps a family or an elderly person who gets dropped off at this stop and needs to navigate across this entire, you know, monstrosity of a high speed roadway. Talk a little bit about that, because I think that's that's one of the things, the themes that I was I, I was really encouraged to see in your book is, you know, addressing the fact that we do have these massive high speed, you know, streets and strodes that just are not conducive to, you know, people trying to get around if they're not in a car. Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that you don't appreciate until you're trying to do it. And um, you really don't appreciate until you're trying to do it, say, in a wheelchair or with a child or, you know, pushing a grocery cart. Like, it it really um, isn't real when you're in a vehicle and feel that sort of protection of a vehicle the way it is when you're not in a vehicle. And, you know, to get to the week without driving challenge, um, I think this is why we created this challenge, because we wanted people to understand what it's like to to feel that way when you're trying to get across to a bus stop or to you know your grocery store or your church or your school that that is something you're either going to have to uh you know do um and take that risk and feel that fear or that discomfort or or you're not going to make that trip or you're going to have to ask a favor to to make that trip which you know comes with its own load of you know well okay what what at what cost right so uh this is our week without driving website for the national week without driving challenge uh we started the week without driving back in 2021 in washington state and the idea was okay we've done all these interviews with non-drivers and and um done a lot of work to try to highlight these stories. Now, how can we get elected leaders and policymakers and folks who work at agencies that work in transportation, how can we get them to really understand why, why this matters and why we need changes and so that they have a bit more fire lit under them? And and that's where the, the idea came out of. Uh, basically, it's you, you try to get around uh, for a week without driving yourself. It's for all trips, not just commute trips. And that's really important because it's often those other trips that are harder uh, to make. And um, it it isn't about, you know, riding a bike necessarily or walking, right? You're allowed to ride transit. You're allowed to ask for rides because for so much of our country, it's just not possible unless you're driven to get somewhere, right? The, the, The infrastructure is so lacking and the distances are so great that really your only option is going to be asking for a favor or paying, perhaps if you're in an area with ride hail, paying for ride hail, but that's increasingly expensive. And so, we hear a lot of stories of folks who, you know, end up not going places that they would like to be able to go and, and understanding sort of that feeling of isolation and also relying on favors and understanding a little bit more that it's not so easy, especially for trips that might be seen as not completely essential to ask for favors, even if you have friends and families that can drive you places. So, and then, you know, a brilliant way for folks to understand, oh, that's what it feels like when there's no sidewalk or when I'm waiting at a bus stop in the rain and then have to walk into a work meeting and I'm all socking, soaking wet and, and cold. And, you know, the, the, the understanding, these are little things that we can start to do to make our communities more accessible for non-drivers. And also big things that we need to start investing in as well, like housing near transit and more transit and actual pedestrian infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. And in the uh, in the book, you have a, a story or two of of people reflecting on exactly how hard it really is and was for them to experience that. I'm also pulling up uh, the America Walks uh, uh, website here. We had referenced uh, Mike McGinn, the executive director of America Walks earlier. Uh, Again, uh, they partnered up with you last year, I think. Yeah, so mm -hmm, last year. So we, we did Week Without Driving two years in Washington State. And then we really saw, we got a lot of uh, contacts from folks wanting to bring it to their states. And uh, I didn't have the capacity to do that from where I was at, but uh, knew Mike McGinn was interested and saw the value in this. And so we approached America Walks and they have a terrific organizer there, Ruth Rosas, who does the national organizing for Week Without Driving. And so, yeah, that, that started last year. I think we were able to get to 41 states uh, which is just incredible in the first year of a program. And we're aiming for all 50 states this year. It's September 30th through October 6th. 
can see it right there. Org yeah. is the website. Yep. And yeah, we encourage folks because it really is an, an, an awesome way to understand the challenges non-drivers experience in your communities and to also build a coalition with folks from different perspectives, right? Folks from disability orgs, organizations, folks from active transportation, biking, walking groups, folks in public health, folks who work at transit agencies, you know, to bring people together to say, okay, it's, it's not just one of these things that's going to make it better. We have to make sure these networks work in, 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 in together in tandem. And, um, and, and that's how we're going to create communities that are uh, more accessible for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I mentioned to, to you before we hit the, the record button that, that I actually profiled a week without uh, driving and I didn't even realize that it, that was going to happen uh, when I was interviewing uh, Darcy Kitching uh, from Boulder, Colorado. She's a TDM specialist uh, there uh, with the Boulder Chamber of Commerce and the Dol- uh, Boulder Transportation uh, uh, group there. Um, she brought it up and we, we profiled it and boom, right there, the second link. On the uh, in the show notes uh, is the week without driving. So that was super, super fun and, and surprising and and a delight because she was able to reflect a little bit about how challenging it was for her, even as a professional who's working in that field. And, you know, and she's, you know, she's a single mom. She's like, you know, doing things and, and the, the things come up. And, and so I think that that's one of the most powerful things about that type of this type of experience, this type of challenge is it really does help put people into, you know, into those shoes of being able to feel like this is what it's like to be able to, you know, try to get around without driving. Yeah, it's it's a really a great challenge, and I, I'm hoping that more communities can figure out, and more more advocates can figure out how it can be useful for them. Because I think it it does bring us together and 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 point out you know where the gaps are in a really uh, wonderful way, clear way. Yeah. I want to pull up uh, a, another image here, um, uh, taking us back into the forest and back into the, the thing. Uh, talk a little bit about um, this experience and, and why this is so important for, for cities to take into consideration. Yeah, so this is an image of Ian Mackey, who organizes an event called Ian's Ride, which is an inclusive walk, roll, bike, run um, that goes across three days in Washington state. And Ian's a power chair user. And I think I, I interview him in my book and we talk a lot about micro mobility and e-mobility. And I think Ian, there's so much potential right now in this space for more access. And yet a lot of that potential has been sort of directed towards people with a lot of resources and you know people who already have mobility options. I'm thinking a lot of you know e-scooters and e-bikes uh, that that really are are you know um, designed in ways that work well for non-disabled folks who don't have to carry groceries or don't have a kid. Um, but there's so much potential for this battery technology uh, to to transform the lives of people with disabilities who do need to go places um, with kids and with groceries and all of that. And so Ian and I talk a lot about what it would take to get power wheelchairs, you know, to, to be, you know, hardier, to be able to handle more weather conditions, um, to be able to have longer lasting batteries so people can go, you know, all day and not have to worry about running out of a charge and be limited um, by that. Um, I also interview some other folks like myself who can bike but can't drive and really the the potential that e-bikes have opened up in our lives to be able to carry kids and groceries in ways that that you know weren't options before and so i I think that this is something that gives me hope but we need to make sure that we're continuing to invest in in solutions that are that are really inclusive and i i'm seeing this happen more and more i'm seeing more e-trikes i just saw like an e-bike with a seat in the back for carrying passengers um, you know, there's a lot of talk about golf carts and um, I, I do think, you know, we have to start figuring out where where are the physical places in, in our communities that these are going to be used? Um, what are the paths? You know, what, where is that space and, and making sure that we have that space uh, to, to connect and get around on, you know, non-car size, non-car speed types of mobility devices. 
Yeah. Yeah. And in this particular image, we're really seeing too another side of what accessibility can mean is accessibility into nature, being able to reconnect people into green spaces and how powerful and important that is for, for health and mental health. It really is. And um, one someone I worked with for a long time and now is, is working on a project called Transit Tractor. Uh, I interview in the book and uh, Kim is uh, really focused right now on how can people who can't drive get into into open spaces, into green space, into parks and using our existing transit networks, using existing, you know, bike paths. How can that work? And I think it's it's important to think about. I also want to shout out to Safe Routes to Schools Partnership. Um, they do a lot of work on, on, you know, access to parks right now and green space in our communities. And I think those are so important because we, we built, our, you know, so much of our country and our national identity around access to outdoors, but that's always tied to driving and, you know, owning vehicles that can get you there and, you know, get you into the mountains, get you in the, into the trails. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. We can have transit to green space. We can have trails to green space. Um, we can have green space in our communities. And yeah, this next image really uh, hits at that. This is a, a block party on my block in Seattle. And, you know, thinking about, okay, we have a lot of space in our communities dedicated to cars. Um, how can we use that space to differently? And for me, as someone who can't drive, it was interesting because during the pandemic, as more of my neighbors were around, as everyone stopped driving as much, we had a really wonderful time connecting uh, through block parties to our neighbors in a way that there wasn't that sort of connection before. And I think, you know, it was especially transformational for me because I'm not able to easily get across town to visit someone. We don't really have the the reliable transit here in Seattle the way, um, you know, it, it's, it can be, you know, a 10 minute drive and it'll take an hour on the on the bus, right? That's just the reality. And so having those social connections close by is so important. Uh, it would also be great to have, you know, more uh, more fifteen minute city type opportunities like a pharmacy and you know a rec center and you know those types of things as well. But we can start by building those communities with our neighbors, and so I talk about that in this book, and and that is an important thing not just for our mental health but also resilience um, in the face of climate change and natural disasters. That those those connections to your immediate physical neighbors become really important in times of crisis. Yeah. And you do talk about this in the book. And I was very encouraged to see that you talk a little bit about land use and how powerful it is for somebody who is a non-driver to be able to be in a, a community, in a neighborhood. You mentioned it earlier with, uh, you know, the one person who uh, was using transit and, you know, felt like she her world was opened up because she was able to move to a place where she could use transit to be able to get to things. But then on the flip side of it is too, is land use and being able to have more meaningful destinations in closer proximity and have more affordable housing options near meaningful destinations. And so I also, when I see this picture of, you know, of, of the, the value and the richness of being able to connect to uh, the people nearest us along our block is also having hopefully more meaningful destinations just around the block or, you know, just at the end of the block. Talk a little bit about that because I thought that was a beautiful part of your book too, of, of really pointing out that it's not just the streets that need to change and become more friendly to non-drivers. We also need to be transforming our communities to, you know, also align with that more meaningful destinations in shorter proximity and nearer yeah, proximity. I thought a lot about this right and you know how do we how does that happen and how do we get there and what you know what would need to change in my neighborhood right now to make that happen when you know right now there's most people i know get in a car and go to costco for their shopping and you know the costco is in an industrial area it's not easily accessible from where i live at all and so you know how could you could a, could a grocery store exist here um, or would it, there's just not enough business because it's so easy for people to drive somewhere where land is, is cheaper, right? And how do we change that? I think those are, those are really big questions. I think the bigger question though, is, is just the housing affordability. I'm, you know, incredibly lucky that I live in, I can, I can live in Seattle, right? And that's not something that many people can afford, especially low-income and disabled folks. And so, the, um, 
I hear again and again stories from folks who are priced out of living where there is transit, where there are sidewalks. And, and so in exchange and people who can't drive, right? And people who highly value those things because they're absolutely necessary for them. And yet it's not even a choice. They are back, you know, in the rural communities where they grew up living with their parents because that's what's affordable, but there's no transit and they're back isolated again. And so there's so much we need to change there uh, to make it possible for we to have housing where there is transit and also to make sure that where we're building, you know, new housing, we have that, that we insist that there has to be sidewalks. We insist that there has to be transit, um, that we don't assume that everyone's going to have a car because they're not, um, and, or they can't afford to. Yeah. And, and part of what has to take place for us to be able to change some of these dynamics, and you do address this in the book, is we have to be realistic about the the fact that the status quo has a vested interest in kind of keeping things rolling along the way they are. And you, you present some strategies as to as to how we might be able to do that. And one of the ones I wanted to pull up here is an image of a walk roll audit, because this is one of the ways that you can sort of like be an eye opener to some of the powers that be and as as well as, you know, other stakeholders as to the challenge that's out there. Just like with the one week without driving challenge is a great eye opener. So is this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> this was a walk roll audit again in Seattle. We have a lot of new construction going on here. And it's been a pet peeve of mine because coming from New York City, when there's construction, you put up scaffolding, the sidewalk stays open for the most part. Or if it doesn't, then it's just bumped out a bit. It, it remains open in one way or the other. In Seattle, the status quo is shut down the sidewalk. No one's using that. Too bad if you have to cross an arterial extra two times and there's no you know light or way to do that you are out of luck and so this image here is a, a walk roll audit we were doing and we were focused on sidewalk repair we weren't even you know trying to talk about sidewalks being closed and we got to this intersection and there was a, a sidewalk uh construction closed side fully blocking where folks with wheelchairs would be able to roll onto the sidewalk and, and get out of this busy arterial and it this is so common um and yeah, so I think, and, and then, and, you know, it was nice in this one, we had some folks from the city with us who, you know, were able to, I think, remind some of the contractors on this site that they really needed to make sure that there was an accessible path available. But uh, I haven't ever been on a walk or lot that I thought was a waste of time. I think every time <laughs> we're out there, people learn things. And I think because, you know, so often people with disabilities are, are not um, necessarily visible um, there's so much shame and then there's also just so much, you know, isolation or the challenges, logistical challenges of being in community and not having the support to do that, that when there is these opportunities to, to learn from your neighbors and from your other community members, it, it's so valuable. And so I, I encourage everyone, especially advocates and folks who work in agencies and um, our elected leaders, our policymakers to, to seek out the time to do this. Yeah. And here we're back at the the week uh, without driving. A couple of images. Uh, any final thoughts on the week without driving that we may not have uh, captured earlier? Yeah, I mean, I think one really important piece of the week without driving is it came out of the the work we did interviewing non drivers and involuntary non drivers from throughout the state of Washington, and we really wanted to ground it in that experience. the The idea um, for it came originally from my experience working in the labor movement and, and doing, you know, day in the life of uh, visits where service workers would be paired with elected leaders so that elected leader could experience their, their day for uh, a day. And I, I um, did this with um, then candidate, now Mayor Mario Bowser from DC, who spent the day with a housekeeper. And I remember we met at the housekeeper's home and she rode the bus and then she had to pay again to transfer to the DC subway, the Metro there. And then we had a really great, you know, they had a great conversation about what it meant for her to have to, you know, pay this transfer fee. And that's, that's been removed now, thankfully. Um, there's not that transfer penalty, but it just made me think that there's, you know, there was so much potential here for people who don't always experience things to see, see it from a different perspective. And so uh, we really do encourage with the week without driving for folks to partner with disability organizations, partner with folks who, rep, you know, organizations that work with immigrants, with low-income workers who are riding transit and walking and rolling 
because that is their best or only choice. And, and so that those, those experiences are understood. And so that, that image there of Crystal Montero, as I mentioned earlier, that was her uh, pointing out her, her transit stop to some elected leaders who were doing Week Without Driving and talking about, okay, there's no sidewalk from this bus stop to my house. And, you know, when it's muddy, I get stuck and neighbors have to come push me out. And, you know, I, I think that, that reality sunk in. And so that, you know, project is now, you know, getting worked on or hopefully getting some sidewalk built. Um, but, you know, it takes people feeling that personal connection sometimes. And that uh, is something that the week without driving can, can achieve. Yeah. I want to go back to this image here just because it's such a powerful and disturbing image at the same time. <laughs> um, so when I see this too, and, and, and you had mentioned that, that you use a bike uh, to get around, it's something that you're able to take advantage of and, and be able to have some mobility. And one of the things that, that I notice um, from my travel in Europe is that there is a great deal of mobility that is, is, is really afforded to those who are in wheelchairs and other mobility devices um, because the cycle networks are so well built and so protected and so smooth, whereas many of the sidewalks are quite old because many of the cities are quite old and, and they may, might be paver stones and cobblestones and, and certainly not as easy to roll on. Um, and so for somebody who's on a bike, for somebody who's in a mobility device, having access to truly high quality, all ages and abilities, again, all ages, all abilities, cycle network facilities really is quite empowering for, for people over there. I'm most familiar with, with the Netherlands. I spend a lot of time there. Talk a little bit about that, about that from your perspective and the work that you have been doing and how that could potentially be a solution for the image that we're looking at right now, which is overbuilt streets and strodes again, with more than enough, you know, right of way to be able to have protected infrastructure for, you know, for people on bikes, as well as mobility devices, as well as sidewalks. Yeah, we should, probably should have better sidewalks. We must have better sidewalks. But you know, if we really want to get, you know, split the hairs, we could say we also should have continuous elevation sidewalks and bikeways too. In other words, they shouldn't have to dip down to each roadway level. So uh, talk a little bit about that and address that because you feel it every day as somebody who gets around by bike. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think that the, the question of, you know, would do, do bike paths in the U.S. provide access and better access for people who are using wheelchairs. I try really hard. I mean, I've had conversations with, with folks who use wheelchairs about this and, you know, I think there's different opinions and I want to be careful not to speak for a group that, you know, it's not my experience. Um, I guess some things I've heard though, is that, you know, bikers can be really rude uh, because wheelchairs are not usually traveling as fast as, as bikes and people bike people feel that the space is, you know, being taken over. Right. And there's, there's, um, there's, there's a cruelty in that. And so uh, I know I have heard stories of that, that in that experience. And I know there's also a lot of ableism, right. In the bike community. So that, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I, I, I'm going to go back to this image right here and, and, and basically say, and call anybody out who's on a bike. If you're being impatient or rude to anybody getting around in a mobility device and they are in a bike lane or on a shared use path like this right here going through the forest that's not cool don't do yeah. that no I shared mean, use path etiquette is is for real and there's there's so much work to do seriously there. seriously people nothing that you are doing is all that important not your workout not you getting to work etc is is to be rude or you know to somebody who is i mean whether it's a child learning how to ride or an elderly person or a person with a disability. I mean, we all need to be able to share this, uh, this non-driver <laughs> mobility space together. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing I'll say though, around, you know, I think most people in wheelchairs who I've talked to would prefer to use the sidewalk if it was accessible, right? Because being, you know, it's not particularly comfortable to be passed by someone going fast 
you know, on a, on a, on another device. Yeah. I think we've all, we've all felt that. Right. And sure, so, sure. um, yeah, so we need to be making our, our sidewalks accessible. We also need connected bike lanes and making sure that those, you know, exist and they're wide enough so that say you did have two people in non-traditional bikes and, you know, cargo bikes or trikes that needed to pass each other, like that could happen. And we have all these, you know, two-way bike lanes that aren't even wide enough for that. So really thinking about how can we have wide enough space so there's less conflict. Um, because right now, a lot of the way we're designing these, you know, these multi-use paths or these bike lanes in cities is that they're, they're too narrow um, to be comfortable for anything but, you know, a quote unquote traditional bike um, to pass. So I'll throw that out there as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I talk about that a, a lot, actually, because, you know, in, and when we look at the arrogance of space that we've had, uh, in designing our roadways, we'll go back to this, uh, this image here where we've got the church in the background and we've got the transit stop with absolutely no accessible way for somebody to get to and wait and get off, d- disembark off of the, the bus. Um, I mean, this this is an arrogance of space for prioritizing the movement of motor vehicles. But the good news is, is we've got a lot of space. In other words, all that has to really be done is this to be programmed. I mean, in in many very, very old cities, I mean, you spent some time in New York um, in in very, very old cities here in North America, as well as, uh, you know, old cities in Europe. You don't necessarily have this sort of space available we have this space available. We just need to redefine it, reimagine what it can be so that it can be redesigned and be a, you know, all ages, safe and inviting place for all ages and all abilities. Exactly. No, I mean, you, you go to, you know, especially cities in the West, there's so much road space. Yes, um, yes. And, and it really is time to reimagine it and reimagine it even, you know, beyond maybe you don't even need that much space for mobility, right? Maybe some of it can be housing. Maybe some of it can be green space, you know, well, the, the, yeah. it's just I mean, such so, an excess, right? Yeah. I mean, so you say this is sort of rural uh, Washington area here. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not an, a transportation engineer. I can't off the top of my head tell you what this is built for in terms of the number of vehicles uh, on a daily basis, but I guarantee you it's way overbuilt. There's no oh, yeah. reason for this many lanes. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. This could be an opportunity for uh, additional safer mobility facilities, as well as opportunities for maybe some depaving and addressing another aspect that you did cover in the book is, you know, we've got a little issue of a climate crisis going on. And so that also could be, you know, something that we're taking into consideration here is, you know, trying to uh, you know, make it a greener, lusher, cooler place as well. And when I say the word cooler, you know, somebody who's living in Austin, Texas, one of the things that, that just irks me is when I see a transit stop like this have absolutely no shade, you know, for somebody who's waiting for, for transit and the fact that they're being exposed to those extreme temperatures. Talk a little bit about that, because I think that's just, it, it just doesn't, it, it, it angers me a little bit because it, it kind of gets to a theme that you had mentioned. There was a, I think it was a director of planning in, um, oh gosh, help me out here. Which city was the director of planning? She has a, a week long challenge or, you know, for, for her staff. Oh yeah. Christina Swallow. Yes. In Tucson. Mm-hmm. In Tucson. Thank and, you very much. Another hot Yeah. Yes. <laughs> when she did the challenge, but yeah, no. And I lived in Tucson for a little bit, so I've been, you know, like shade is, shade is critical. Absolutely. Um, and, and without it, you know, it, you can't, it, it's deadly, right. <laughs> to be waiting for the bus in the summer. So yeah, how, you know, and, and, and with all the pavement reflecting heat around you like that, that is just, you know, you, you learn how to find the shade real quick <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was stuff like this. And this is, this is a part of our state in Washington. That's quite hot as well. Um, in the summer. So, you know, those, those shade pieces are, are really important. Anna, thank you so very much. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure. I'm going to pull your your, your book up here real, real quick. It is available in the Active Towns uh, bookshop right here. And we'll scroll on down. There you are right there, right uh, between Confessions of a Recovering Engineer by Chuck Marone with Strong Towns and the brand new bike 
Bicycle City book uh, that is coming out from Professor Daniel Pietkowski at Oslo Met University. And again, uh, this is published by Island Press. Thank you so much, Island Press, for doing that. And uh, the book is coming out when? book is coming out May 9th. So I'm, I'm 9th. so excited. And I, yeah, really thank you for having me on and, and the opportunity to talk about this work. It's been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, fantastic. And, uh, and this is dropping. This is happening. This is going out on May 1st. So folks, you have eight days to get your pre-orders in. Please order this book. It is an absolute delight. And Anna, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Anna Zivarts. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to do. Just head on over to the Active Towns website, activetowns.org. Click on the support button. There's several different options, including becoming a a Patreon supporter. All patrons do have access to all my video content early and ad-free, so that is a very nice bonus. Uh, also, hey, you know, consider picking things up from the Active Town store. I've got some really nice uh, swag out there, including the coffee mugs and t-shirts, which we talk about in this episode. Uh, I really do appreciate you tuning in each week, and I really appreciate any support you're able to provide. Uh, and until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity health and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.